welcome to this um, special funny comb called uh, Taking Your Work to National Festivals. Um, before we begin, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the land on which I'm speaking to you from. Today is the traditional land of the Ghana people, uh, and we pay uh, respect to their spiritual relationships and connections to their country and land. Um, I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, my name is Andy Beecroft. I am the Marketplace Manager for Honeypot. Um, and our honeycombs are designed to give uh, our artists a, a snapshot and a brief insight into um, certain delegates, uh, their festivals, events and profiles, um, to give you some further information on potentially taking your work across to their um, particular events or getting in touch with them through the applications on my honeypot. So today's uh, Honeycomb is taking your work to national festivals. So we've got a great um, range of Honeypot delegates from across the country, from a diverse range of festivals that you might want to consider. And we'll be hearing from each of them today in more detail. Um, joining me today will be Joe O'Day from the Bunbury uh, Fringe, uh, Ali Wellburn from the Perth International Cabaret Festival, Tom Oliver from Wynnum Fringe Festival, Izzy Hart from Ballarat Cabaret Festival, uh, Maddie Warren from Dream Big Children's Festival, and Mary Jane Warfield from Wide Open Space Festival and Desert Festival, and finally, Rachel Chan from the Bondi Festival. So uh, a lot of different types of events that you might be able to, want to consider. Um, and I look forward to hearing from each of our guest speakers today. So uh, the first pe person we'll be hearing from will be over in WA, yeah, and we'll be um, hearing more about Bunbury Fringe from Joe O'Day. Uh, over to you, Joe. Thank you. My name is uh, Joe O'Day. I am the Artistic Director for Bunbury Fringe. Bunbury Fringe is it's a regional fringe festival. It's been running for seven years now. We just finished our seventh year and I've been running it for five years. It is uh, an incorporated not-for-profit. So we are managed by a board, a committee. Um, we certainly depend heavily on funding and we are a curated festival. We run for eight days and we find that with those eight days, the curation um, really probably fills our brief better because it means that we, we have to really cater for a, a very diverse group of people within our community. So Bunbury is a regional city in WA. It's uh, the first regional city outside of Perth, but we're still quite small with our, um, I guess with our catchment close to greater Bunbury, we're close to the 100,000, but realistic Bunbury probably only about 40,000. So it's really important that our festival does cover what most festivals do, which is youth, um, your millennials, your, your older demographic, your different genres of music. And we find that the curation means that we can do that and, and do it well. It doesn't mean that we don't ask people to apply, but generally I create that core program and then we work to enhance that with other things that might come in. Um, we program pretty much anything and we're open to anything. Like I'd like to say we have cutoffs, but I'm always open to new suggestions. I mean, as an example, we had a small classical music show approach us four weeks out from our festival, Bowbird, which is a little play, a little um, group from South Australia. And they just said, look, we're coming through, can we perform? We said, yep, yeah, no problems, we'll find you a slot. It was an 11 a.m. slot. I didn't know how it would work, but it was amazing. And we had you know, more people than I expected. So it's just an example of what we can do, but generally we program, you know, comedy is always very popular at festivals, uh, cabaret, obviously. I do try and work with a fairly strong music program because we do find that the music really brings in the people that aren't sure. And, you know, if you can get some popular music that gets people into our garden, then everything else unfolds from there. We work really hard with our garden, our festivals, home base is called the Sterling Street Arts Centre. That is a basically a visual arts centre. It's a historic building that's had a new development built on. It's only quite small, but what we've been able to do is they're on the fringe of the CBD, so it's literally in the CBD, and they have this big lawned area and treed area, 
to the back of the building. So we fence that off. So that becomes our fringe garden for the eight days. And what that does is it means that we can allocate that space. We put our bar in there. We put lots of visual arts, the big component of our festival as well. So as an example for this year, we had um, a couple of domes created by artists, um, a beehive that was like LED flashing lights. And then within the garden, we have dancers, hula hoop people. Um, we had uh, human paintings this year, people that have got all body paints and that sort of stuff and did dancing. So what we do is obviously get those people into the garden, then they experience the program, that big music program then attracts people in and then they explore other things. Then we also obviously do a bit of theatre. Theatre, I find, is still the hardest thing to sell. I, you know, I don't know why because there's so, so much good theatre out there, but it's definitely still something where we use smaller capacity. Um, we've got two spaces within that garden. So we've got the garden. We set up a big top, a circus tent that seats 250 and about 300 standing. And then we've got what we call our theatre space, which we've taken over um, a flat floor space within the centre, and that's a 100-seat theatre. So we probably spend the same amount of money on the big top production as we do the theatre production, but the big top probably attracts about 10 times more people. So that's the balance we've got to try and find. I'm probably diversifying a bit here. Uh, Programming lead time, I've already started programming for next year. Our festival finished on Saturday. I'm already thinking about what to do for 2024. So it never stops, as you would all know. We just continue to think. I've got people messaging me every day with ideas. And we definitely want to grow our festival, but we're being very careful about how we do that. It's taken seven years and to get where we are now. And we're finally, we've had some amazing funding. We've got, we've got some RISE funding in 2022, which helped us a lot. We picked up uh, regional remote festivals funding this year. Um, so that's really helped us a lot, but it's really about building that, that little bit of surplus so we've got the confidence to keep moving forward well in advance and keep our, our staff, I guess, employed. We all work on small term contracts or short term contracts. So there's seven people contracted for the festival and most of those only work between uh, probably three and five months and it's and it's still part time so they you know half of it's a labor of love but the aim too is to make sure that these people um, have the confidence to, to stay employed we all work on other projects none of us focus purely on Bunbury Fringe because Bunbury Fringe doesn't have the ability to retain all those people full time and I guess at this stage we don't need to but we also understand that we need more resources for a fringe to grow and that means spending other times of the year looking at fundraising opportunities, which you're looking at now. We're doing, looking at doing a film program, but also ways of attracting more, um, more sponsors and, and more funding, I guess. Um, so with the programming lead time, I guess going back to that, I leave the programming link open on our website all year round and people are encouraged to apply. And we do get regular people coming through with applications. The thing that I tend to say to people is that, you know, I will consider anything that comes through, even if we can't program it at our fringe, we run a fringe buddies program. And what that is, is our community engagement program or a big part of our community engagement program where we attract local business and usually non-traditional spaces to run activities and events. So examples are that we had a brewery run a small opera performance this year, we had um, a rooftop bar do a little uh, Indigenous art exhibition. We had a local restaurant do uh, Italian street food. We had our local theatre company run a PVI collective show. The art gallery ran some additional exhibitions, storytelling in the museum. The um, Sour Sports Centre actually ran a, a music sun, sundowner. So the idea behind that is to really, fringe takes over the city, but we don't have to manage it. But uh, what we end up with is we had uh, probably about 35 or 40 shows outside of our eight day festival that are, I guess perceived under the fringe umbrella, which they are. So if people apply and I can't, 
I think it's got merit, but it's not going to fit into our program. I might approach uh, a local business or a small venue and say, look, these people are coming along. We can potentially assist. I'll put a little bit of money away for the budget, uh, Fringe Buddies budget, so that if we need to, so that we can give you a few hundred dollars towards this performance if you want it. Um, and that's how we really build our program without the owners coming back on us and without the owners coming out of our budget, I guess. I guess maybe one thing um, I'm curious about is in terms of um, sort of the cross programming between Perth Fringe, Perth Festival and Bunbury Fringe, do you find that there's a potential for people to, you know, bring work over to Perth Fringe World and potentially up to Bunbury? Is that something that uh, is part of the, the, the discussion and dialogue when you're kind of talking about the curation of work that, that takes place there? Because I start my programming before Fringe World does. And then Fringe World open and close their registrations when I've almost finished my program. So what we found about four years ago was that Fringe World had some clauses in their contracts that said that uh, shows were exclusive to them. So uh, we got in touch with Fringe World and said, look, can we have a, a sit down chat and um, work something out? They were super open, more than happy to chat. And through that discussion, both parties agreed that um, we are certainly not a threat to them. We can offer one performance. If anything, we can help promote their performances. And it's really just about utilising space and trying to work out um, timetables, I guess. So that worked really well. And so we program some events that go to Fringe World, particularly as an example, we've had the gods, the gods, the gods this year. And they did us first, and now they're doing Fringe World. We, we love, love Tommy's Bunbury. And here's what you missed. <laughs> we love coming to Bunbury. And here's what you missed at the weekend. See you in 2024. Yeah, I love the kind of the spirit and the ethics of Bunbury Fringe, that sort of um, connectivity to the town and, you know, people traveling through. And uh, the, the sort of jump points from Bunbury to other sections of WA that you can take your work. Please do drop uh, Joe a line if you do think your work is something that Bunbury Fringe would be really interested in. Um, thanks so much, Joe, for, for, for My everything. My pleasure. I can keep on going. <laughs> we'll have to talk afterwards. Um, my next uh, next speaker is going to be Mary Jane Warfield. I'm really, really pleased to welcome Mary Jane. Um, it's actually going to be the first time I think Mary Jane's taken part in Honeypot while I've been here. So I'm super excited to welcome Mary Jane to the, the festival and, and Honeypot. Um, but yeah. Really looking forward to kind of uh, hearing a bit more about uh, yourself and the, the two festivals that you're going to be talking to today, Mary Jane. Sure. Thanks, Andy. I also go by MJ. Um, so Mary Jane or MJ is good. So my name is Mary Jane Warfield. I'm here. I'm on Arundel Country. I'm a Bantua Alice Springs. Um, and I work for a number of organisations in town, but the main one I work for is I co-manage Red Hot Arts Central Australia, which is both a service org and a producer. So um, we'll just talk today, I'm here to talk about what we produce, which is our annual desert festival. So that's our main event. 
Um, so it's a multi-arts festival that runs over about 11 days. This year it's on from the 21st of September to the 1st of October. We'll be opening EOIs in uh, March, closing in April. Um, we do tend to focus on developing local artists. So we have a development program that runs alongside the festival called Project Seed. Something I wanted to mention to artists today is that we often look for mentors, um, either producer mentors, artist mentors. So part of Project Seed, the, um, the participants get um, a couple of hundred dollars to just consult with a mentor. So any artist who might be quite experienced or think they have something to share could reach out to me around mentorship for um, remote artists. So Desert Festival, yeah, it's 11 days, it's multi-arts. Um, we, yeah, the travel costs can be a bit prohibitive. So we tend to have a small number of visiting artists, but please do reach out, put in an EOI um, if you think you'd like to come. In the last couple of years, we've mostly had solo artists come up just because so that we can have more um, visiting artists. Um, so I've got plans to run a producer's lab in 2024. So I also wanted to use this opportunity to put that out there. So just looking at trying to pull together the funding to run a producer lab alongside Project Seed. Um, so for this, yeah, keen to hear from independent producers and artists who might be interested either in-person mentoring or remote. So we have the tech here set up to do remote mentoring on a big screen in our studio, which has been really great, especially for dance and theatre artists. Um, yeah, so special considerations when coming to the desert, um, culture shock, extreme weather, um, high costs of getting here. It is a, Alice Springs is a remote town um, with a lot of stuff going on. Um, so I, I think it's really important if people want to engage that they do a bit of research first or maybe speak to people who might have been to, um, to Mabanto Alice Springs before. And the engagement tends to be, rather than just a fly in, fly out, it tends to be more longer term. We like to develop relationships with artists. Um, so if that's something that um, tickles your fancy, please reach out. And, um, and the lead time tends to be, it can be 18 months to two years lead time. So um, it's good to be thinking what you might want to be doing in 24, 25 to engage with us. Um, so I'll play a little video um, from last year's festival. mention is that it's very broad programming so we program broad um, broadly for, you know from kids through to very adult entertainment um, and because we try to cater for everyone because we're a remote town with a small population but very diverse population so we try and represent that like Joe said about Bunbury when you're in a regional place you tend to broaden out that um the audience scope I think um the next thing I want to talk about is Wide Open Space Festival which for me is a separate um, separate job, so a different organisation. Wide Open Space is a grassroots festival that started as a bush doof, really. Um, about 10 years ago, a group of mates got together and were like, we want to do a local party festival. And it's grown and evolved into this beautiful arts and cultural, I mean, it's beautiful to start with, but it's grown and evolved into a more broad arts and cultural festival that has really strong connections with the local Eastern Ireland traditional owners. 
Um, so that's on in April. So it'll be on this year from the 28th to the 30th of April. Um, my role is to manage the arts program. There's also music, roving, kids, workshops, forums. So that's again, pretty broad. Um, the thing to think about with Wide Open Space, it's an outdoor camping festival at Ross River. So you're out, um, out of Alice Springs. So it's, yeah, the camping. And what have we got? Sorry, just looking at my notes. It's a very queer friendly festival. So that's something to keep in mind. Very much encourage queer artists to reach out. There's a huge queer community here in the Bantua. So um, very much celebrated. We like wacky, risky adult programming for that, as well as we have some family stuff during the day, but it's really something that the more um, out there kind of artists might like to reach out about. Our EOIs for that have closed this year because we're on in April. So they'll open again in October, November next year for the following year. So both the festivals I've talked about do have expression of interest processes. And then those EOIs are looked at by panels. So it's not just me curating from the EOIs, but it's a bit of a process of we talk to the panel, they give advice, and then I um, pick through that um, sometimes with other people as well. So it's very much a collaborative process here in Alice Springs in terms of curation to really try and get that balance. Thanks so much, uh, MJ. It's great to, to hear all that. And I think there's some amazing bit of information to pull from that. Um, you're actually going to be in Adelaide from the... Um, let me see, the 11th to the 19th, 19th. Of yeah. March. So um, when this goes out, uh, you'll be able to uh, meet up with, with MJ um, at the high potentially. Um, and, you know, also you'll be in town as well. So, yeah, we do encourage you to, uh, to uh, pop over to Delegate Finder, pull up uh, MJ's profile and um, take a look uh, and contact MJ if you think your work might be suitable. Um, we're going to pop back over to WA for um, Ali, Wal uh, Ali Wellburn from the Perth International Cabaret Festival to give us a little bit more information uh, about uh, everything that goes off uh, during your event. Thanks, Ali. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for the opportunity too. This is um, this is really good. Um, I'm coming from Wajak Noongar Buja. Um, and uh, so pleased to be talking about the Perth International Cabaret Festival. Um, we were actually established as a not-for-profit organisation in uh, 2019. Um, 2020, as we all know, had other plans. Um, so we didn't go ahead with our festival in 2020 as we had originally planned. So our first festival was in 2021. Um, I'm one half of the co-founding team. Uh, Graham Lovelock is the other half. Uh, so uh, we both hold joint executive uh, roles in terms of being executive producers. Um, I look after the marketing and uh, essentially most of the programming and Graham looks after the governance and finance aspect. Um, we are also lucky enough to have our guest artistic director is Adelaide's very own Michael Griffiths um, and we're very proud that he agreed to be the inaugural artistic director um, and brings no shortage of skills to the table um, to Perth which he actually calls his second home because he spent a lot of time here in Perth uh, living as well. Um, we are uh, festival curated, um, but we also have an expression of interest component to it as well. Um, and that is essentially the expression of interest component is just for West Australian based artists. We really want to celebrate our West Australian artists who often don't get the opportunities um, that perhaps might be in other states, um, particularly around cabaret. Um, the reason we established the Cabaret Festival, I think this is really important to note, is uh, that when Graham and I were deciding that we wanted to work on another project together, we very quickly discovered that Western Australia and Perth, obviously, was uh, the only major capital city in Australia that didn't have its own dedicated Cabaret Festival. And we wanted to um, align ourselves with, with what the other states were doing, particularly Adelaide. And we've looked very closely to Adelaide as the model uh, to which we work by. And we've got a really good and strong relationship with the Adelaide Cabaret Festival. And um, our ideal timing is that we will eventually be the first stop in Australia. So at the moment, we're currently sitting in June. 
um, and it's uh, sort of mid to late June that the festival sets. Uh, but once um, once we can get her into our venue at the ideal time, because there's some long-term bookings in there at the moment, we will actually um, be more at the beginning, end of May, beginning of June. So we'll, be, we'll become the first stop um, that artists, particularly coming in from overseas, can use to then travel on to the other states and the other festivals. Um, we wanted to put it into the winter time frame um, because there's a lot happening in Perth during summer. We have uh, Fringe World, which is uh, currently on at the moment, um, which goes for another two weeks. And uh, sorry, yeah, two and a half weeks. And, uh, and then Perth Festival crosses over into that as well. So we were very conscious that that time in the market is saturated with a lot of things to do. And also we feel that cabaret is very much a, a winter activity. Um, you can snuggle up and listen to all those amazing cabaret sh um, shows and drink mulled wine and do all those fabulous things that you can do at a cabaret festival and also so that we can link in with those other festivals around the country as well. Um, our home we are very lucky to call is His Majesty's Theatre. If anyone's been lucky enough to go to His Majesty's Theatre, it's an absolutely stunning Edwardian theatre based in right in the heart of the city. And um, we mix it up in the venue. We activate the whole entire building and we've actually created some new spaces that have never, ever been used before. Um, one in particular, which we were able to launch in 2022, was a new space called On The Boards. And essentially we put the artists and the audience on the stage of His Majesty's Theatre, which is actually a very, very deep set um, stage. So that's our midweek component for shows. It has a capacity of around about 210, all seated at cabaret tables. And of course, if you're sitting on the stage, you get to look out at the beautiful auditorium itself, which the majority of people never actually get to see. Um, so it's a completely different um, perspective for audiences. And um, that in itself becomes as much as uh, part of the entertainment as the, the artists that are performing in front of the audiences themselves. Um, we also activated a green, green room right down in the basement, um, aptly called the basement, um, which has seating for about 40 to 60 uh, people, depending on, on how it's activated. Um, and that had one of our local artists, Thomas Ford, uh, performing there who actually brought in his own camping chairs as part of the show um, right through to the dress circle bar and of course um, downstairs at the Madge which has a seating capacity of around about 145 all at cabaret tables. We also activate the main auditorium and our festival bookends that with the use of the main auditorium um, which has a seating capacity of around about 1,200. Uh, we tend to just open the stalls, which sits at around about 600. So the whole building is basically alive. Um, we have pop-up bars. There's a pop-up bar as part of the on the boards um, uh, configuration as well. So people can sit at their cabaret tables and they can get up and they can get drinks during the show and so on. So that kind of gives you a feel for how we use the building. Um, we want people to think differently about cabaret and we felt that that also needed to happen with the way that we use the building. Um, and this isn't a criticism of Fringe, but often shows get labelled as cabaret in Fringe, which are more circus or magic shows or comedians and so on. And so we wanted to go right back to the root of what cabaret truly is, um, which is storytelling set to music. Um, our First Nations culture is really, really important to us. Um, and we acknowledge that our, our First Nations people are the first storytellers in the world. And uh, so much so that we're lucky enough to have uh, Gina Williams and her artistic partner, um, Guy Gauss, as our patrons of the festival. And so um, that's a, a very big acknowledgement to us. We were also the first company ever to go into His Majesty's to do a smoking ceremony on stage, um, which was really gorgeous because we opened our first festival with Gina Williams and Guy Gauss um, to the smell of eucalypts and um, lemon um, uh, wattle trees and so on that had been previously burnt through um, 
through from the their smoking ceremony on stage. So it was really apt for us to to start our festival in such a way. So I guess on that note, we really want to celebrate the diversity of stories that are actually out there. Um, so we look for submissions from First, Na First Nations people, people from the LGBTIQ um, plus community. Uh, we look for stories from seniors. And in our first year, we had Carlotta at 78 uh, gracing our stages. Um, we look for stories from young people um, and we look, story, uh, look for stories from people from different multicultural groups. Um, so we really want to celebrate everybody that's in our community. Um, there are some fascinating stories out there. Uh, and as I said, in our first year, we had Carlotta at 78 and um, our youngest performer was 23. Um, through our Expression of Interest program, which is for West Australian artists, um, last year, we were lucky to unearth 19-year-old Eloise Madison, who was a First Nations singer from Bustleton. Um, and uh, she, yeah, you got to watch out for her. She's amazing. Um, who, for the first time ever, was not singing in a pub somewhere uh, and actually had a captive audience listening to her. So it was a new experience for her just to be in a venue where everyone had actually paid a ticket and was there to see her perform and, and tell her stories. Um, we are also open to being approached from artists. So whilst it is a curated program, um, we're like Joey's, um, we're receiving emails from people all the time from all around the world um, saying, look, I'm going to be in Australia or I'd love to come to Australia. Can we open a conversation? So I guess just as our um, Cabaret uh, Festival is all about storytelling, we're very much about having conversations. So um, we'd love to be approached by anybody and everybody. If you think you've got a fantastic story to tell, um, then we'd love to hear from you. to hear all that information from you. Um, if you want to get in touch with Ali, um, dig into the Delegate Finder. Um, Ali will have been here in February, but um, hopefully has potentially seen some great shows, but um, I'm sure is keen to hear from more of the artists taking part in Adelaide Fringe. Um, we're going to jump over to the other side of the country now in uh, Queensland uh, to one of the, the newer fringes, which has uh, just popped up over the last few years. Um, I'm excited to uh, introduce Tom Oliver, the founder and director of uh, Winham Fringe. Um, Tom, tell us a bit more about Winham Fringe, please. G'day, g'day, no worries. Can do, thanks for having me. Yes, very fresh and new festival. Um, I'm coming to you live from Kondambuka country, which is uh, about 14 kilometers southeast of Brisbane city. What I love and don't love about the town Wynnum is and and Wynnum Fringe is that people think that Wynnum is this really rural regional place in the middle of nowhere but we're uh we're 14 k's from the city and we're still <laughs> technically in Brisbane City Council region which is a great thing and a bad thing all at the same time but um I'm an artist singer and an actor and pre-COVID I was um, frolicking about in various productions um, uh, all over the world and then in 2020 I ended up um freeloading with my folks uh, and twiddling my thumbs in my hometown, Wynnum, where I grew up, the place where I've been trying to get away from for about 10 years. And then COVID threw me back here and I was like, it's pretty good. I don't know why I've been trying to run away. And I've sort of embraced my hometown 
that I'd been away from for a while. And um, in 2020, we threw together this big YOLO excuse to just do something because nothing was happening. We were really lucky in Brisbane because the restrictions weren't as bad as our friends um, uh, in other states and countries. So we did this thing called Win and Fringe, which went from concept to opening night in about two months uh, in November of 2020. It was something to pass the time. Me and my mates were unemployed. Let's just do something. And we applied for some funding. We had an amazing local sponsor, um, Rain and Horn Real Estate, come on board. And suddenly it was more than something. Uh, we employed 200 artists and 10,000 people came through Wynnum CBD across uh, three days. So uh, it was very exciting and, and we definitely passed the time in a fun way. And then by the end, uh, I thought that was it. And um, the response on Facebook from most of the attendees was, I can't wait for next year. And I was like, what the hell is next year? And uh, now we're into year three. So 2021, um, we were lucky enough to score some RISE funding. Um, and I, I added um, a few more days. So we went from three days in year one to seven days in year two. Year two, we had 25,000 people come along. Um, we had a slightly bigger program. And then now we've just finished in December year three, which was a three week operation um, and the craziest time of my life. So we um, we had 36,000 people come in year three. We sold 18,000 tickets and Win and Fringe is um, partly um, curated and partly open access. It's very much still finding its feet. And we're sort of now at the stage where we've done three successful operations and we're, we're starting to do some really long form planning with applications for multi-year funding. Um, we've got some really um, great local sponsors that have been with us since the start and Brisbane City Council, Arts Queensland uh, have been along for the ride too. So I'm this kind of new director dude that really loves his job and um, very much comes at it from the perspective of an artist. Uh, and our demographic out here is um, parents who are in their 40s with young kids and retirees. Those are the two big demographics. Wynnum Manly has about 30,000 people spread across it, and that's just a small pocket of um, the Brisbane Bayside, which has uh, many, many more people. So there's, there's quite a market for it, and because Wynnum has never seen an event of this size and def definitely with this sort of... Um, professionalism uh locals have really responded positively to it we had a, a 95 percent positive experience um rating just recently uh and i i think i know of maybe three complaints of thirty six thousand people attending so the response locally to the festival is really positive uh and i've got a little video of uh our our week one wrap up of the winham fringe gardens <laughs> That's, that's pretty much me. This year we had, um, and, and we're, we're now planning to just calm our farm a bit and copy paste. Like we're not going to grow any bigger in the short term. We're going to do three weeks again in 2023 um, if a few funding applications come off. So just keep those fingers crossed for the next few months. Uh, it's Wednesday to Sunday night um, for three weeks. And this year it'll be the 15th of November till the 3rd of December. Um, we had the Aurora Spiegel tent last year, which is 550 seats. The main show in there was Velvet Rewired starring Marsha Hines. Um, that played eight shows a week. And then we programmed before and after with various comedians um, and, and heaps of great local talent, which have been performing with us since 2020. 
Uh, and then across the other side of the field is the dome, which is owned by Head First Acrobats, and that's about a 330-seat venue. Their show, Gods, was the main show in there, and then we programmed various things before and after. And between these two bigger ticketed um, spaces, we had a container bar, a Ferris wheel, and some free programming that roamed. And we we really felt that the free programming enhanced our zone and kept people around longer. So we're very much um, enjoying working with companies like Mimetica and Coco Loco uh, to create the vibe. And we, we're very open to hearing about more acts that can activate spaces uh, and keep people around and entertained. And then outside of this hub, which is the real focus of the festival at the moment, um, there's lots of great local restaurants and cafes and bars and and laneways and jetties uh we did a thing called drag on the groin which was a drag show on a little jetty um last year uh, in 2021 those sorts of opportunities are available very much finding our feet still uh, we know what works and what doesn't work here and keen to chat to any artists producers collaborators technical people and other festivals who want to jump on board and, and vice versa so come and say g'day and um our next speaker is, we're going to go back over to Victoria and take in uh, another cabaret festival, uh, the Ballarat Cabaret Festival, which is directed by Izzy Ha. And um, we're wonderful to hear a bit more about uh, everything you do over there, Izzy. So uh, yeah, tell us a bit more, please. Amazing. Hi, everybody. I'm Izzy Hart. I um, am another artist who accidentally started a festival during COVID when I wasn't allowed to do all the things that I had planned. So um, I totally relate to that. Um, and yeah, I'm a cabaret artist of origin and um, yeah, uh, I'll try and keep it snappy so that um, we'll see what we can fit in. Um, we're a very small, very new festival. We're excited um, to be doing what we're doing. Um, the story is Ballarat used to have a cabaret festival and then it didn't. And then a small team of us uh, brought it back. Um, we did, we were planning our first online, um, our first um, festival and got put back in lockdown. And so we did a series of monthly online cabaret salons that went beautifully well. And then last year we had our first in-person festival, which just kind of scraped through between before the next wave of COVID nonsense really gave a lot of people a hard time last year. Um, so uh, we've got one beautiful little venue with a couple of spaces um, running. Uh, we had traditional cabaret shows um, and then um, a few other things. We had a queer brunch. We had um, like a festival club, which is sort of like a lineup show at the end of the night. So um, we're sort of looking for, um, I guess, traditional cabaret performers. Um, if you're a variety performer with something interesting and fun, let us know. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, cabaret, variety, circus, dance, but sort of within the context of cabaret um, is sort of what we want to, where we want to keep it. Uh, we run in November. Um, and at the moment, we're a really small operation run by a team of enthusiastic volunteers. So we're looking for um, sort of little shows and um, we're sort of looking at particularly for our next year at a fringe model where if you have a show that you can bring, we will offer you a venue, we will assist you with marketing um, and we will offer you a percentage of ticket sales. But at the moment, we're like building towards hoping to be a curated festival and um, cross your fingers for us. So um, yeah, we also run a mentoring program with local artists, which is yeah a beautiful, amazing thing. If you um, have uh, mentoring skills as well, um, we're not running that at the same time as our festival this year because the timing last year didn't really work. So um, you could be a mentor and don't have to be a part of our festival or the other way around. Um, and yeah, we're also um, really super keen for volunteers and team members as well. So if you've got skills that you want to um, collaborate, you can come and find us. I'll be in Adelaide in March. So from about the third or the fourth until the end of the festival. Um, and you can find us online at BalloratCabaretFestival.com or at Ballarat Cab Fest. And um, we're in the, in the producer guide as well. So yeah, drop me a line. And yeah, as you say, you're going to be here in March, so please do um, 
drop you a line or, or make sure they try and find you at the events and um, say hi. And um, yeah, wonderful to have you here today. Um, so our next speaker is going to be Rachel Chan from the Bondi Festival in New South Wales. Um, tell us a bit more about Bondi, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, um, my name's Rachel. I'm coming from Gadigal, Birigal, uh, Gadigal, Birigal and Birbirigal country. And um, Bondi Festival has been running now for about, I think this is our 11th year or 12th year. Um, so we were Bondi Feast previously up until 2019. In 2020, uh, we combined in January 2020, we combined when everything was hopeful and wonderful um, with another festival and became Bondi Festival. Um, then uh, Bondi Festival 2020 didn't happen, 2021 didn't happen. 2022, we created an uh, extremely different festival to what we'd previously done. And now we're at 2023 looking to roll out something different again. Um, so we run every winter. So we're an arts festival that take over Bondo Beach for 17 days and nights in the winter school holidays. This year's festival runs from the 30th of June to the 17th of July. We take over the Bondi Pavilion. So um, it's been shut down for renovations for the last few years. So we've kind of been popping up all over the suburb since it closed down. But this year, the Bondi Pavilion reopened in September. So we're looking to uh, jump into our home again. Um, the Bondi Pavilion has a 200 seat theatre. It's got a bunch of other multi-purpose rooms that we transform into different spaces for the festival. So we've got a um, 150 seat cabaret hall, a 40 seat comedy room, and then just like a bunch of other small rooms that we're um, putting in more site specific works. We also have the atrium of the pavilion, um, a huge courtyard out the back, which I'm desperate to fill, um, and a forecourt that looks out onto Bondi Beach. What else do you need to know? Uh, so we generally program theatre, comedy, cabaret, circus, immersive and interactive works, family shows, magic, installations, and pretty much everything in between. Uh, we look for works that provide our audience with unique audience experiences. So we're trying to find that thing that they can't get the rest of the year. Um, we also are looking for works that engage directly with our community. And um, we had some really great experiences of that last year with a walking tour that used that worked with children from the local primary school to curate this audio walking tour and so just like kinds of shows where we're working with the community or creating experiences for the community to uh, really get involved as well. Um, similarly we're looking for works that engage directly with the space that we're in so some more site specific or site responsive works so things that can really take over the pavilion or things that can take over the beach um, we've, we're in a very um, iconic and you yeah a very iconic location being on Bondi Beach but we're trying to sort of think about that differently so how can we get people to think of Bondi Beach not just as a place of like what it is at the moment, which is sunshine and surf and beautiful, but like how can we change that conversation or contribute to that conversation in a different way in winter? Um, we are, our programming lead time look much like the rest of you. Um, the festival finishes in late July and we start thinking about the next year in late July. Um, the best time to get in touch, however, is generally around November. Um, we try to lock in a lot of the program around December. That said, it's floating. So at the moment, we our program goes live mid-May. We still have some spaces um, and we're still sort of shuffling things around at the moment. So if you've got a show that you think will uh, bowl our audiences over, then by all means, still get in touch. Doors are never closed. Um, also, we have, so the festival is curated. There's not like an, exp an official expression of interest um, forum. It's kind of like drop us a line at any time, let us know what's going on, invite us to your shows. Um, we also have our Bondi Festival Local, which is much like Bunbury Fringe's um, Fringe Buddies. It's a similar program that we started last year where we're encouraging local businesses to program their own excellent arts and culture um, activities during the festival time. This year we're playing around with how that model works, but there will be a sort of matchmaking process. So um, if you are not 
if you don't happen to be programmed as part of Bondi Festival 2023's core program, then there's always opportunities with the Bondi Festival local program as well. Um, in terms of our timeline, we're quite conveniently positioned in the lead up to Edinburgh Fringe. So we find that a lot of artists um, really make the most of coming to Bondi Festival, doing a show here and then jet setting off to Edinburgh. Um, we, our model is, we used to run on sort of more of a fringe door split model. Now we are moving away from that as a um, local government funded festival. Um, so we are paying uh, show fees, but that said, we are um, still trying to reach our budgetary goals. So uh, we are doing our best to make it as artist friendly as possible um, and We'll work with you to, to see what that means. Um, like I said, in 2022, our festival was significantly smaller. So I think in 2019, we had 45 different shows over three weeks um, in nine different venues. And in 2022, we had eight shows. So it was like a huge reduction. Um, we we uh, held those in a little barber shop in town, um, the Bolo walking tours, um, hidden venues. This year, we'll be looking more towards 15 to 20. So uh, we, we won't be going, we won't be going back to, um, to that kind of capacity programming where one of the lessons that we learnt over lockdown over the last few years is to do less and do it better. So that's our focus for the next couple of years to try to build capacity and to build the reputation of the festival and to not uh, cannibalize our own audiences. So for instance, our um, we, used, we used to run at a pretty healthy 60 to 70% capacity um, of tickets sold. Last year, uh, we ran at 85% capacity of tickets sold and um, that was during the wettest July on record. So we feel like we've, we've learned some lessons and we're gonna roll that with us into the future. Um, but Bondi Festival, yeah, we're always keen to hear from you. We program local artists, interstate artists. We've once programmed international artists. There's always a conversation. Um, so please get in touch. Brilliant, provocative, and totally entertaining. Oh, I think it was wonderful. Had a great time. Magical, inventive, and charming. Oh, I thought it was absolutely brilliant. It's hilarious, outrageous. But yeah. Definitely come, it's worth it. It was hilarious. I mean, you don't really know what to expect. It's awesome. But thanks so much for um, thanks so much for sharing all that information about Bondi Festival. Uh, really excited to uh, to also welcome you back over to to Adelaide this year, and um, hopefully you'll uh, be able to uh, program a good amount of shows from Fringe. And um, please do reach out to Rachel and her team uh, through the Delegate Finder as well. You can find our details. Uh, through my honeypot and delegate finder and um, so least but last but not least is uh, is the very wonderful maddie warren who's coming today from uh, ghana country um she's um she's with dream big children's festival um uh, and uh yeah really excited to hear a little bit more about what's coming up for dream big in, in the next couple of years over to you maddie thank you andy uh Down the road from Ghana land here in Africa, Australia. Um, so, Dream Big is a children's festival hosted at uh, a festival centre. Uh, we're a biennial festival, so we only count every second year. Um, our next festival is this May. Um, we're a two week festival. We're one of the oldest children's festivals in the world. So, in 2025, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary. Uh, we are a curated multi genre festival. So, um, for instance, our 2023 program includes music, dance, theatre, performances, workshops, interactive installations, visual art exhibitions, digital experiences, and performance tours. So we kind of we have a little bit of everything. Um, while we do have a general public program, our focus is primarily on bringing arts to all South Australian schools. Um, we focus 
a lot on schools that are educationally disadvantaged. So uh, in, in education terms, we focus looking at uh, category one to four schools. Uh, they will come to the festival centre here or across a couple of venues um, around the city, um, or we take work directly into schools. Um, so the students, um, because I know transport is a big uh, barrier for a lot of a lot of schools in terms of the costs. So we try to make everything as accessible as possible. Um, about seventy percent of our program is free offerings. Um, we work a lot with the Department for Education here in South Australia um, presenting our festival and they support the teachers with resources based off the program that's curated. Um, we are looking for all kinds of work. Like I said before, we kind of we work in every sort of space. Um, we really enjoy works that are, don't necessarily fit into the traditional theatre spaces, um, works that are engaging, interactive and participatory. Uh, primarily from kindergarten to uh, through primary and early secondary. We kind of cover that, that area of um, school. Uh, we don't typically program shows that have been in fringe in recent years, uh, just because it's kind of cutting through the same sort of audiences. But if you have newer works or older works uh, that are kind of of interest, um, get in touch, absolutely. We want to hear about it. Um, in saying that 2023 is fully programmed, we're actually already on sale, um, not to take away from fringe audiences, um, but from so anything from now, we'll be looking for our 2025 festival. Um, and like I said earlier, it's our 50th anniversary, so it'll be bigger and better than ever. Um, but we we really just we we have everything. So it's a it's we're excited to kind of find new new works and and uh, new ways of reaching the the kids out there. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have kind of a lot of different genres. Um, we have a we primarily have a lot of work from South Australia, but interstate we take, and we also have a couple of international um, shows as well. So we we take something from everywhere, um, and we're really kind of keen to work with um, all types of artists. Uh, we would, have, would love to have more First Nations work as well, um, but apart from that, that's kind of we will we're interested in everything. Uh, that's kind of it. It's pretty it's pretty basic uh, in terms of the rundown, but yeah, we're get in touch there's two of us on the delegate finder um and we're interested in just uh yeah having a conversation excellent and of course being based in south australia you're available throughout the festival um, um yeah i guess the first primary contact is through delegate finder um encourage you to, to reach out to, to maddie and her team if you think you've got some uh, potentially exciting new work and that you're looking to, you know, potentially um, uh, present in the future. As, as you said, you don't necessarily really tend to program straight off the back of Fringe that works here. But um, yeah, I think it's really interesting to kind of get um, an idea that there is obviously a lot of delegates in uh, Delegate Finder that are also looking to um, discuss potential new works. Uh, as I'm sure all the delegates today are also keen to kind of uh, hear about the different types of works that you might be working on in the future, uh, not just the works that are taking part in Adelaide Fringe, which are, I suppose is a, is a great way to kind of uh, end today's uh, information session. Um, yes, please do use everything uh, at your fingertips on uh, My Honey Pot. Um, the dates that delegates are in town is listed as part of their profile. Um, the virtual delegates that aren't able to take part personally uh, are still still really worthwhile to contact with. Uh, it's about creating a dialogue, a conversation, and starting that initial touch point and conversation along the way. Um, so please, please do get in touch uh, if you think your, your work or your creative practice really speaks to anyone we've heard from today. Um, so I really want to thank again the, uh, the panel. Um, we've had a, a really great sort of um, diverse, energetic, eclectic, um, amazing uh, overview of, of, of some of the, the, the festivals and events that take place uh, throughout Australia with many, many more that haven't been um, personally been able to present information today, uh, but they are on Delegate Finder. So you can kind of really um, hopefully look to sort of forge and, and create a, a really good 
uh, expansive network of onward programming. So yeah, I just want to thank Ali uh, Welburn, um, Tom Oliver, Izzy Hart, Joe Day, uh, Maddie Warren, MJ Warfield, and Rachel Champ for taking the time to uh, give us a really good overview and insight into their uh, amazing festivals and events. Um, so thank you.